the Neil Empty Show. My name's Joey, and I'm joined by Paul. All right, mate. And Neil. Hello. And talk us through the Grimsby game, uh, Laurie Kilpatrick, the lonely season, who you may be aware of from either previous pods or from his blog. Hello, Laurie. Hi, Joe. Um, um, we've got to start off with the hot topic of the week, which is Mark McNulty's goal, the first goal against Grimsby on Saturday. Can I go round man by man and very, get, a, get a very quick take on whether you think it should have stood? Neil stood? Yes. Paul? Yeah. And Laurie? Yes, but only because it was for us. <laughs> yeah, I think that might bias the selection, so, uh, the choice slightly. But I'm glad to think, see I think it should have stood. He I think the it ball. says him right, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's Nathan Clark. It's a delicious retribution for all of the hand that he had in our demise last season. Um, perhaps we could be a touch more creative with our moments of the week than just that little bit of paradise. Um, Neil, what would you go for? Well, I really wanted to say um, having an extra Tony at the club, but um, <laughs> just so I can reuse all my material from years gone by. But I have a quote, actually, which is my moment of the week. I'm going to try and read this without stuttering because I'm not a very good reader. But um, The goal they conceded couldn't have been much more slayed if we'd glued the shit baseball cap to, his, to the ball and twatted him with the boot of a smouldering Nathan Clark effigy <laughs> ourselves. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Um, that's all right. That's our esteemed guest. That is, we returned to his <laughs> blog this week, and I thought that was absolutely spectacular. <laughs> Not only because it just um, just encapsulated Russell Slade, because um, I don't hate Russell Slade as a man. I'm sure no, he's a lovely gentleman, but yeah. I think as a manager of Comedy City, I, I find it very hard to think of anybody else I hate more, <laughs> just because of how shit he made us. So and that. That made me laugh and also hate him a little <laughs> bit more as well. So thank you. He's the we've talk, we've done this to death, haven't we? The difference between human beings and their yeah. sort of like football of what they're emblematic of. And in terms of anyone who is emblematic of something awful on field for Kov, Russell Slade is pretty much the kingpin of that, isn't he? It just it's he's yeah, a fine. it's a walking tragedy. I don't wish him any ill will. I just wanted him to, like, fall into a puddle that went waist deep at half time. <laughs> but I didn't want him to break his leg while he was in there or anything. Um, moment of the week, I Paul. Oh, sorry, go on, sorry, yeah. Just how much you talked about... Was it you or someone else? Just how much of a nice bloke Russell Slade was, I think, last week. And that in any other circumstances, like, we would have all, like really liked him as a bloke and I couldn't stop thinking about that while we were like hammering him from the away end I was like you are you are rubbish in so many ways but you are probably nice which I was torn but obviously it's much more fun just to do what everyone else is doing who I saw somebody saying that they had um seen him they were like either lost or pissed somewhere and uh, he, he like gave him a lift and played bingo with them and stuff. I saw like, that. Yeah, like that a really a low value version of Mike Ashley. <laughs> just yeah. Give me the lift, <laughs> not buy the whole pub of pint. And you're right. It makes it really difficult to then, you know, come up with sort of really vile epithets from the sidelines. But I guess it's not impossible to do it. Um, Paul, let's have yours. Uh, yeah, my moment of the week. I have had very little interaction with Coventry City Football Club in the last five days since we last did this pod, other than seeing the um, the video quite quickly after the goal on Twitter when someone went, look at this, we've just scored this goal. So I'm, I'm breaking with my new traditions of going against what Joey says, and I'm going against what Joey says. My moment of the week is the fact that they conceded that goal because it was hilarious. And it seems to have summed up for a lot of people what League Two is all about, which is pretty shit players doing pretty stupid things. Can I say? Let's hope it continues. Can I say, you sound audibly dejected when we are on a winning streak of games. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, the thing is, I've got literally nothing to say about it. I, I obviously didn't go to the game, so I, I'm, I know we can download an app now and watch us play. Slightly got better things to do. From all accounts, the first half, and I'm sure Laurie will get into this, the first half was an abysmal game of football, from what I understand. So I was sat on a beach in Blackpool with my kids, having a fun time, checked Twitter, saw this post of this goal, thought, that's hilarious. Turned off Twitter, checked it about 20 minutes later, we were tuning up and we had won, and just thought, well, that's great. 
And then I've read Laurie's um, review, which is just an incredible piece of prose, and then thought, shit, I've got to talk about this on a podcast. And then thought, <laughs> it's all right. Laurie's on, and Laurie can talk for England. So <laughs> I can just give as little as I need to today. And I've just had my wife go, oh, I'm going upstairs, but I'll be able to hear you moan about it. I've got nothing to moan about because we won 2 0. And I've literally got nothing to say. So I was going to listen to you three talk and then throw in questions every now and then. More of that later. Um, I find yeah. it really funny that you've got you've got better things to do than download an app and listen to the game, but you haven't got better things to do than go to Blackburn at home <laughs> on a Tuesday night in person, pay for it and watch it. That's a bit from but don't you, don't, from Manchester. Have you learnt nothing from last week? How don't much prod him. Don't. So uh, no, no, I'm not going to rewatch Commentary versus Grimsby. Um, sorry, like Sammy definitely is though, so he can. Tell I us. did it as well. Quite enjoyable. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, Laurie, your moment of the week? Did you already do that? No, I didn't. Um, I'm actually torn between lots of good things that happened that weekend because I was actually there for two days. So I went to Lincoln before. That was really nice. Had a swim before the game. That was really nice. Had a chat with a... You know when you like bump into a really nice fan on the way to the game? And I chatted to this Grimsby fan for about 15 minutes on the way there, which was really nice, who warned me not to go back a certain way because I may or may not get like murdered by one of their fans but definitely moment of the week was waiting for Duckins to come on because obviously I heard you talking about him loads and I was very disappointed he wasn't playing and then when he came on I could just see what he was all about within 10 seconds because he yeah. was like I've got three minutes here you know what I've got to do as soon as I get the ball no one else exists I'm shooting and lo and behold got the ball he's like 25 yards out on the turn not even facing goal just hammers one over the bar next time he gets the ball same again and then he he does it he ends up getting four shots off in eight <laughs> minutes and they had the ball for about four of those minutes so fair play the duck he backs himself yeah huge fan of that um, I will round things off by siding with Grimsby's um, outright refusal to acknowledge the first goal <laughs> oh, God. as a goal, specifically in the context of the fact that in a 2-0 win, it ultimately didn't matter whether it was a goal or not. <laughs> it's a, a defeat is still very much a defeat, isn't it? I, you you want, if you want to call it a 1-0, that's fine. I'd be, te- I'd be tempted to say to them at this point, that's fine. We'll chalk it off then. <laughs> what, you've you've, you've won still that be one. top as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I um, I would like to hear you talk more about Duncan's Nazon Laurie, but I do feel like if his performance was only like five minutes ish long, that there's probably not a great deal more to say. But were you are you willing to try? Well, apparently I can talk for England, so well, I might yeah, as well of give course, it a yeah. shot. <laughs> um, haven't been to a game for a very long time I think actually since I think I went to one game after Wembley but nothing important um, took loads of fans it was great atmosphere start to finish you know at the beginning of the season when you spend a lot of time like trying to identify who all these people are who everyone's spoken about and I didn't manage to get to any preseason games so everyone was a bit of a mystery Grimmer easily identifiable as you say, good going forward, not so much going back. McDonald didn't really notice him um, because Willis had one of the best games I've ever seen him have for us, to be honest. He was just won everything in the air until he went down. Distribution wasn't awful. Um, back keeper, I was keeping an eye out for the keeper as well after you talked about his like decibel vibes. And you could hear him a bit. It's a big voice. It's a big voice. Stokes look good. Um, Kelly and Doyle, you're not going to get much going forward out of those two, are you? But they look very stable. And there was none of the kind of Blackburn fiasco that I heard you talking about, Paul, where they just lost the midfield. We, we definitely did not lose mm-hmm. midfield because Vincenti was almost an additional centre midfielder at times. And I had a little bit of, not an argument, but like I was a little bit rude about Vincenti in the blog just because he's so tall that like he struggles for coordination and the ball just got kept on. You know, when they haven't watered the pitch quite enough and you think, oh, the pitch looks a bit sticky sometimes almost because it's too good. And he just kept on kind of tripping over things, couldn't get out of his feet. And maybe he is, there is a good player in there, but he 
and he was providing defensive shape. But I, I'm not very good at looking out for left wingers who provide defensive shape. To be honest, that's not why I go to football. But McNulty did absolutely nothing until the goal. Um, Kieran Cowley was on Twitter saying that he he looked brilliant during the game, but I don't think he looked brilliant. I think he reminded me a bit of Josh McCoy for a lot of it, just kind of not big enough to be imposing, not quick enough to be scary. Um, but then as soon as he had the goal, he was, yeah, cock and actually wanted to take people on. Jones was the main light in the first half. Like Paul said, nothing, nothing happened in the first half. I spent about the first 10, 15 minutes trying to like work out whether this was just a bad game. But then you start to think when you're in League Two, or maybe this isn't a bad game. Maybe this is all the games forever and ever. And I should just get used to this. But Jones, they couldn't really handle him. He was cutting inside. He had one really good shot that the keeper got a hand to. Um, but I don't like people say we were on top in the first half. I don't think anyone thought we should have been ahead. Like it was, it was, it was fair enough. He went in even. Bevan. Yeah, him and McNulty didn't offer that much in the first half. Um, but yeah, it was pretty pleasing overall. We weren't losing, which was the main thing. And then in the second half, again, the first 10, 15 minutes, more of the same. But we started to open them up a little bit more. Jones, they tried to double up on him, but he's just too quick. For, I think he's going to be too quick for most people in this division. And then that goal, we'll probably spend a bit of time talking about it, but... It was the reason I compared it to Russell Slade so much in the blog was that it just smacked of like complacency, yep. zero plan whatsoever, as if things were just going to work out without you in any way guaranteeing that they did. And the fact that Clark hounded the ref so much almost just made him seem more guilty that he'd realized quite how much of a mess he'd made of it. And yeah. I also think the keeper would have. The keeper should have just not moved if if he was completely convinced. Done, well, done about it. The about it, yeah, exactly, yeah. and just played it that way. But did anyone I, think that he, um, Clark's remonstrations of the referee had a whiff of Finchy on the Quiz Night episode of The Office? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where the, the, <laughs> The damage was absolutely irrevocably done, yeah. but that he's still there afterwards going, yeah, but that actually wasn't the kick. That's the thing. You're just <laughs> like, well, it's it has happened now, hasn't yeah. it? It's a little bit after the horse has bolted, unfortunately, for you, Nathan. He's thrown a kettle over a pub. What have you done? What have you done? Well, <laughs> we're 2 up, mate. Um, I think, to be fair to it, that was him passing it back, but the, po- the problem was... He'd already set to do all the other stuff. He'd put his hand on the ball. He'd set to do a free kick. So, like you say, it's pure complacency to sort of assume that the ref's just going to say, oh, don't worry about it. It's his own fault. That's all I see. I look at a player there just being completely daft and uh, looking like he's going to take a free kick, then change his mind. But it's already happened, Nathan. You've messed I, it up. I still, yeah, think, I, I still think that the referee was probably unnecessarily pedantic in allowing it. And I also wonder how much of it was just being caught up in the heat of the moment, going, yeah. oh, shit. Um, and I this think... Is yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but I think he can't... He, did take he, the, he was making a point. He can't disallow... Didn't he take the free kick, though? Well, this is the thing. I wonder whether he can disallow it, given that he's had the ball in a set position and he's kicked it backwards. It kind of... You'd struggle to, if he did say, no, it doesn't count, if then we argued the case of, well, why? I don't know, I don't know where it stands. But I don't, I think it was pretty clear that that wasn't him taking the free kick, was it? He was just giving it back to the keeper. But the thing is, once you, unless the referee told him to move the ball back. Yeah. Then, as far as I'm concerned, the, the ball was dead, the referee said play on, he kicked the ball, free kick taken. That's yeah, it. yeah it definitely is. It definitely I think that's is. all there is to it. By it? the law of that with the law, it's just yeah. his motion. He's not taking that free kick in his own mind. He's passing it back. But like you say, by the letter of the law, everything he's done means he's taking that free kick. So it's it's legit. Yeah. And the thing is, if you're 35 and you're, <laughs> yeah. still, ma- and you're yeah. still making errors like that, you get no. If you'd have picked the ball up and thrown it to the goalkeeper, that's different. He's kicked it from. He's kicked yeah. a dead ball. That Sorry, he he's taking the free kick. I, I say, think the main he, thing... Even Facebook, if he doesn't think it in his own mind, he's taken it. Yeah, uh, yeah I think sorry. the main thing in favour of it being disallowed 
is quite how bad the ref's performance was overall, that that is more likely to be a wrong decision than a right decision because he didn't make many right decisions. But I've also missed out the penalty, which is the main reason it should have counted, mm. is because there was an abs- absolute stonewall penalty. Vicente. On Vicente. Like, he must win so many penalties because his legs just, they're in the way of everything. So <laughs> it was one of those ones where he, he tripped over the ball already and then his big, long twiggler was just dangling out there. And he was trying to get off a really bad shot with terrible backlift. And the defender just did one of those like kind of rugby ankle taps that's just so comprehensive because the player is so committed that they go down so emphatically. And the ref just waved it away and it was criminal. Everyone lost it. And for once, the mob were right. It was a penalty. But that's why no one felt bad about it. I mean, no, no way and ever feels bad for getting an open goal. But, yeah, we deserve to be one up because of that. Because we never miss penalties, you know. <laughs> were there a few penalty shouts? There was... Jody Jones, first half? John Jody Jones that... The thing is, he's just in a bit of a Raheem Sterling Suarez situation now, whereby I don't even believe him if he goes down in the box because he goes down and just doesn't only go down, he pretends he's really hurt every time he goes down as if like pain is in some way connected to, to free kicks. But the, it was all the way at the other end. I couldn't really see. But he had a kind of three in a row and one of them where the home end lost it at him because he'd he got them booked and won a free kick. And Jody Jones is awful at free kicks, by the way. I don't, had I missed something in the first two games because when we won the free kick, everyone was like, oh, Jones, 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 take it. And then, I mean, nothing's changed. From, like, he's, he's rubbish at them. He's like Biggie. He wants to be a free kick taker. He's this illusion of a free kick taker. He wants to be Madison, basically. And he's he not, does, yeah. He just mm. practices all the time. And he may occasionally put one in. You just see him running after the ball every time we get a free kick, even vaguely close to the box. But um, I, I can't see it happening, really. He, he wanted to take one in the first game, and I, I think McNulty took it and put it into the wall at about three foot off the ground. So I think it was probably his turn this time to uh, take it badly. Maybe <laughs> you've got a good free kick. Andrew can take one. Uh, go on, Neil, I was going to ask. Who, Willis. Who, oh, Willis, really? Joel, he's got one of those... Uh, Wobbly Ronaldo, David Luiz kind of free kicks in his heels uh, free kick. Yeah, one of those. I've seen him do them quite a few, but he just doesn't. He doesn't get close, does he? Where You're not going to let Jordan it? Willis have a go, are you? Really? Where have you seen him do that? He, he used to when he first came through, like in the squad, like just before the game. All he was doing was those free kicks, and I was like, he'd just sit, just watching them, and they're, they're wobbling all over the place. Nice. And I know this is just defending if he's practicing his free kicks all the time. Yeah, he was young. He's one of the like. It's the same as like Reece Charles Cook there doing keepy uppies all the time. It's like go and practice catching your dickhead. <laughs> doing tricks all the time. Um, just a question. Talking of, I mean, by the sounds, Jones is a bit of a funny one. I understand why. I think Jones gets kicked quite a lot, so that's why I think giving him a bit more benefit of the doubt. But one of the things that really annoyed me the first game was McNulty and Bevan falling over at every opportunity. <laughs> How did, I mean, you sort of said that McNulty was quite quiet. How did that partnership, I mean, did that partnership look threatening or even remotely interesting? Or would you, do you think that's a, a go a long term? Um, I think they grew into it as the game went on. Like Grimsby seemed to get pretty, like side, side Sammy was saying their defence got a combined age of like 150 or something mad. And you'd think with, a, with Bevan up front, fitness would play against us rather than in our favour but as we got into the game we seemed to get better McNulty was making more runs even Bevan was like running the channels and I'm not sure if it works as like a conventional partnership and once the duck was on he was just a much more obvious threat than either of them Um, but yeah I don't think that their link up wasn't particularly remarkable in the first half and none of them neither of them really made an impression it was Jones everything was going through Jones in the first half and that was a bit worrying because when Vincenti's not offering anything I still haven't got my pronunciation of that down yet either when he's not offering anything the centre mids barely go past um 
the halfway line, then there's a lot of pressure on Jones to deliver. And I think once we've got Andrew in and Nazon playing, it will be a much more threatening side because, yeah, we didn't really look like breaking through bar a moment of Jones magic. And he's not going to be producing that regularly. On the subject of Andrew, does anyone know where we expect to see him line up? Because my understanding is that he's very much a number 10 and we don't have a number 10 spot, do we, at the moment? Yeah, that that feels tricky. We're sort of playing 4-4-1-1, aren't we? We're not playing too high at the pitch. They are. One of them is normally dropping a little bit deeper. So whether or not he could play behind, whether or not he could play behind McNulty or Bevan, is, you probably would look for him to play behind the duck as well. That would probably, you know, going forward, wouldn't be surprised by Christmas if that's our strike partnership. Fair the duck is a unit as well, isn't he? He's physically imposing. I don't know why I nodded then. Not like you could see. Yeah. <laughs> it was a safe nod. Of, He's right, yeah. you know, but you know, the cat's looking at me going, I don't care. <laughs> he does that I, thing I, where he wears undersized shorts as well, so he looks a bit like Gary Deegan, so he looks like some kind of man-child breaking out of his clothes, which is, like, pretty threatening. Um, let's bring it back to slightly more tangible things. Uh, I was very impressed with Liam Kelly's uh, corner for Jack Grimmer's goal. Was he taking corners all day? He was, yeah. He was both sides. Um, and that was great. I know Jody Jones took a few, but I'm kind of unsure of what our plan is because Jody Jones does this thing where he puts his hand, both hands in the air and no one in the box puts their hands in the, in the air I'm... unless they're like winking at him or like rubbing their <laughs> knee or something or coughing loudly. I don't, I don't see what he's doing. I kind of think he does it because he's seen other people do it. I was just about um, to say the same thing. He's seen it on FIFA. Yeah. And being like, that's what you do when you take a corner. Presumably it makes you kick it harder or something. <laughs> Is it stretching? Maybe it's stretching. Um, it's but when yeah, they no. differ them up, though. That's what makes me laugh. It's like Sometimes they do one arm, sometimes they do two arms, and then they always do the same corner. It's like, well, what's this supposed to mean? I thought one's supposed to be like <laughs> far post, near post. This one's going to be drilled in. And every single time it's keep his hands, keep his hands. Like, oh, Jesus Christ. It's just all part of the secret code we don't know about Neil that's what it is Paul didn't we have a thing a while ago of actually sort of trying to note this thing and the inconsistencies of it do you remember who that was (laughs) some years ago I'm sure that was it I'm sure that someone that we stand with clocked this thing of of saying they're putting two arms up or one arm up but it never corresponds to the same type of corner. So we properly think, made an out of it, and it was just like, this doesn't have any bearing on anything. Wasn't it Jake? Jacob Murphy went for a spell where I swear he put two arms up, and then he put one arm up, and it, yeah. I, I, let's face it, it, I think we're all trying to find, it's one of those things which is just that he puts two arms up. If every single player who took a corner put two arms up, meaning far post, then every, you know, it's quite easy to work out. Oh, two arms up, far post, one arm up, near post. And then they could try and fool us. But I think, basically, it just means I'm ready to take the corner, get in position, and then they try. I think 90% of corners are hit into an area where they hope someone's going to be arriving. And it was a bit like that for Grimmer's goal, wasn't it? It was a nicely taken ball in, and Grimmer did a really good header. But like the next time we put it, put it in exactly the same spot, and the defender might head it away. I think yeah. as, as, long as, as, long, as long as it beats the dreaded first man, then it's, I think it's just the luck of the draw where it ends up after that, to be honest. That area that, that you're talking new about new levels of basic, called... isn't it? You're like, I'm putting both my hands up because if you didn't know already, I'm about <laughs> to take the corner. <laughs> and Paul... But I think it's, it's, it's the signal for runs, isn't it? Basically. I'm ready. Are you ready? No. Okay. I'm ready. You ready? No. Okay. I'm ready. I'll oh, fucking <laughs> kicking it in there. This is about to be delivered directly into the mixer. Intravenously into the mixer. <laughs> Uh, on the side, did you, on the BBC website, they had a thing. I think it was yesterday or on Friday, and it was um, that it was sort of um, he's missed a sitter or he's missed an easy chance, and then it was five questions about how the ball came in and whether or not it's an easy chance to score or not. I and it is sort of basically off. how the ball comes in and how you're approaching it and whether or not you're leaning back and all that stuff. But it was if you get five minutes on the BBC website, it was quite interesting. Uh, yeah, I saw it. I didn't have a chance to do it, but I'll go back to it. Um, Grimmer's header, good, solid header. Um, how did he play? 
yeah, he was good. He's hard to miss with his, his new lid. He's very pleased with that. Um, it was an amazing goal. We never score goals like that. Just perfect. Like, if that was planned, I think it's one of the Twitter questions was, like, was that a routine? And I struggle to believe that we're pulling off amazing corner routines having been relegated to League Two. But Kelly batted it in and Grimmer caught it perfectly. And there, were, there was a man on the line and the keeper got a hand to it, I think, but it was too hard. But, yeah, he had a good game. Um, he was getting forward quite a lot, more so than Stokes, which is to be expected. But just a bit sad, isn't it, because of the the situation that's arisen for him to be in the team, which isn't ideal, but I suppose he is. he's a good player, so worse things have happened. Yeah, and I'm sure that... I think the problem is last season, us seeing players like Kevin Foley keep Dion Kelly Evans out of the team. If we've got a right-back who is playing well, then whilst it's a shame for Dion Kelly Evans, who I think we all have high hopes for, there will be times for him to come into the season, no yeah. doubt, because of the amount of games that are played. But ultimately, the only thing we really want is to have a well-performing team... You know, and that includes right back. So I guess as long as there's someone in there that's doing a good job, then I suppose we're all pretty happy with it, aren't we? And he I don't know. doesn't know how long he's, he's a permanent signing. Yeah, I think signed two year contract. Yeah. yeah. Dion, I mean, the problem is now Dion Kelly-Evans is technically third choice, and it's it's one of those things which going back to the Blackburn game very quickly before anyone shouts at me. It was it would have been we're talking about lots of games, and it was one of those ones where it's like, okay, that's the sort of game you're going to play, Dion Kelly-Evans. Oh, you haven't. And I just... The, the aim is, if Grimmer's good, he stays fit all season. And then it's not beyond the France possibility that Dion Kelly Evans may make three appearances this season. I mean, and that's... The hope is, with every player who's in the team, that they stay fit and they play well. Then, in, But at the moment, from what I understand, if Grimmer got injured, the next taxi off the rank, as it were, is Pearson. So Dion Kelly Evans is technically third choice. So I know there was an article on, in the, on the CT about well, players who might leave and all that, I ignored all that bollocks, but Dion Kelly Evans is definitely one of those ones where if you're not going to play him, then loan him out. And I've, I understand a, a striker that we're all quite fond of is being talked about being loaned out as well because he's now obviously with the son of Tony. I think he's fifth or sixth choice. Who's that? So um, Kwame. Oh, really? That's a surprise. So, but it would make sense if, I mean, I think... He's obviously, I mean, he had Kwame at the start of the season, or in pre-season, but he's already bought in McNulty. Bevan's on a new contract, and I think, there's, you know, Bevan's obviously, I would have thought, above Kwame in, in the pecking order if, if he's signed a new contract. So, and he's bought in the duck, he's bought in new Tony, so that makes him automatically fifth choice. Sorry, you, I do um, love how you've embraced new Tony. I was just about to say, way. can we just make sure that they stick as their nicknames all season? That's the Duck and new Tony. Just yes, please. You've made my day, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> I, I re- look, we, I think me and you especially like Thomas. I think it's one of them things where we saw him come off the bench at Oldham, was it? And it's one of them games where yeah. it colours your overall opinion of a player. I would like us to see. I would like to see us keep him. I would like to see him play more regularly. But I also wouldn't be horrendously averse at the moment where we do seem to have decent options to see him go out on loan for ten games or so to get his fitness before coming back. Oh, that's fair. I just think for for me, and I can only base this off off the one game I saw them together. And um, from what I understand from people who went to Grimsby, I, I, I worry with McNulty as, as Laurie succinctly put he's not particularly quick he's not particularly strong so he has to he has to score goals to keep his place in the team because I don't when we don't have the ball or when we're under a little bit of pressure and the game's a bit more scraggy I don't see him adding much because I haven't seen it yet with Kwame I always think he even when the game was a bit being punted all over the ground he was someone who gave us a bit of a physical edge and gave us that um, sort of focus for a striker so but you know it's all about opinions and I think once you start bringing in players which Robbins has then I think Kwame has to you know but as you say I think he needs games so maybe being loaned out to a conference team or whatever and playing 10-15 games and maybe scoring 4 or 5 goals and coming back in January might be like a new signing <laughs> So um, you wouldn't have any qualms with him going out on loan? Oh, nice. 
<laughs> Lovely. Great, ban- great banter. <laughs> um, yeah, Laurie, come on. What? Uh, any final Grimsby thoughts? Any extra Grimsby thoughts? Um, yeah, O'Brien. Um, just a little bit more on him. I th- he was brilliant. He was claiming everything. And it's always sad to see someone come in on top of a player who you already rate quite highly in spite of their few flaws. But I think he's going to be going to be brilliant based on Grimsby. I don't know how he played in the other games, but he just is full of confidence. I think there was a little bit of um, doubt cast on him in the last pod, like whether he'd like played that many professional games, whether he had enough experience. But he doesn't seem short any confidence whatsoever. And I think I'd be happy for him to be number one for the rest of the season because... Yeah, he, he looked great. Um, didn't really get to see much of Andrew um, on the ball because Duckens was kind of trying to steal the show. But and but Ben Stevenson, like he's he's spent a lot of time on his hair over the summer. But is he going to play? Because it's going to be like, tough, yeah. isn't it? Doyle and Kelly. I, I mean, I had Kelly as my man in match second half. I thought he was fantastic. Um, He's only going to play in cup games, isn't he? Because <laughs> you're not going to drop Doyle or Kelly if they're fit. You can't break up that partnership. Partnership even now. But I mean, could you drop just... Vincenti if he's not? Because he's not definitely not a winger. He's not there to offer width. Surely Stevenson. I, th- I can't see him ever wanting to put Stevenson on the wing. If he's going to do that, he might whack Tony out there or even the duck or do something a bit crazy like that. But he Stevenson's middle, isn't he? He could possibly move four three three, which is where Stevenson's always looked best, isn't it? You could, I mean, Doyle, Kelly, and Stevenson seems to work quite nicely, especially with two, well, at least one very attacking fullback. But I also wouldn't necessarily change what is seeming to be a functioning. <laughs> system but it's just nice that we've got options I wonder with Stevenson whether Robbins had originally had him earmarked as a player that would be incredibly unlikely to be here at this point <laughs> or as it uh, as he was expecting and so got Doyle and Kelly as sort of replacements and is now faced with a situation where he may in fact be there and has dropped down the pecking order because of the, the sort of contingency that you'd put in place but I guess so we'll yeah, never yeah, know say again <laughs> So he's basically a luxury that because I'd be more than happy to get promoted, but if we get promoted in the season where Stevenson sits on the bench all year, that seems like such a travesty. But maybe he's just a bit too fancy for this league. I'm not even sure that it's too fancy for this league so much as it's too fancy for the system that he's put in place at the minute. I I I, it, I, I really love Stevenson, but this league is probably if you've got two men in midfield, <clears throat> you probably need to have two. I keep wanting to call them murderers, but I think that might actually... Is that offensive? I, also, we can't keep saying we're playing loads of games so we can keep Daddy Kelly, Dion Kelly Evans because we're going to need him and then say, well, Ben Stevenson's not going to play all season because Liam Kelly and Michael Doyle are going to... It's like we're only three games in, really, two league games. Doyle is 35, 36, mm. and he's going around kicking people. He's going to get suspended at some point. And... You know, we're going to play another three games this month. So, Stevenson, mm. he's just going to have to wait his turn. The only thing that slightly that slightly confused me, uh, Mark Robbins, again, after the Blackburn game, but it was the only time I've heard it, was he was like, I played Stevenson because he hasn't featured much. And he were like, well, you're the manager you're picking a charge, the team yeah. in pre-season. <laughs> so, if he hasn't featured much, that's down to you and not anyone else. But um, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe Stevenson... When he saw, um, I mean, let's face it, the, his immediate peers at the club are Kean Harris, who, without playing as many games for Stevenson, has gone to Swansea, and George Thomas, who think if you'd have asked everyone at Christmas who was the better prospect, everyone would have said Stevenson, has gone to Leicester. So, out of his immediate peer group, two of them have gone on to Premier League and probably driving around in Land Rovers, sort of driving around with a boot full of cash, and he's still going to work in the Fiesta with a boot full of £1 coins. I'd like you to continue to speculate um, on the car and situation in the car of the players and that you went for. See. What's in the CD player in your description there? What else CD the players? They bought brand new Land Rovers. They don't have CD players. What are we talking about? Tape? It's just, just it's, it's all tape. <laughs> connected. It's all automatically connected to their, their wireless um, hi-fi at home. Oh, come on. Bluetooth. They're going to have a boot like Jana Lumu. 
<laughs> okay. More explanation needed. Yeah. <laughs> Type in John Alomo, John Alomo car into the internet and basically just had a car which was one giant speaker. Nice. I wasn't aware Maybe of that. Maybe not now. We all, yeah, we all like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, probably not the best time to do it now. I want to drag it back to Doyle for a little second and ask a question to um, Laurie. Given that we saw Doyle like a million times the best part of you know, ten years ago, whenever it was that he was playing for us. Does it look to anyone else like when he left, he was like, I tell you what part of the game I need to work on while I'm away, kicking people more. Because he it seemed to be like a huge feature of his game before he left, but now it does seem to be almost exclusively the one feature of his game. Which is a huge plus as far as I'm concerned. But he is combative, isn't he? He's taken it up a level, hasn't he? <laughs> if that's even possible. He's also now apparently kicking people in the stands as well. Because it was going around Twitter that he was actually threatening to beat up some Grimsley fans. I know, like, that's technically bad, beating up civilians. But <laughs> we have been, like, softies for so long that I'm so up for us having some horrible man patrolling as long as I don't have to chat to him. Or if he mistakes me for a Grimsby fan, that's fine. But no, yeah, I know what you mean. Maybe he just loves dropping down the leagues because you can get away with genuine murder down here. And... <laughs> I just... Maybe there's also the fact that in the championship, his opponents were slightly too kick- quick to be kicked. Yeah, And well, he's come down to a level where people are a lot more plodding. So I think I could go around and kick. It's like most of... Let's face it, I'd have been one of the younger members of um, Grimsby back four, so I'm pretty sure I could give Nathan Clark a kick up the arse. I just we talked um, we talked last week about not having a defensive midfielder before you know between Doyle and Vince Lowe and then when we lost Vince Lowe, but that there was such a sort of artistry to um, Vince Lowe's midfield sort of dominance. There was so, even though it was like aggressive and firm and everything, there was a sort of it was like an elegant version of it. And Doyle's is just so blunt, isn't it? It's just so aggressive and violent. <laughs> and like Machiavellian as well. The whole thing is just, it's just cheating, isn't it? Rather than any sort of um, football. <laughs> but I'm Do you remember so when um, Vincelo got deliberately well. booked himself? When he booked it? No. Oh, yeah. Well, he, he desperately needed the booking because he wanted to miss a match or something. And the ref just wasn't booking him and he was kicking his guy <laughs> and the ref weren't booking him. So they, I think in the end he just punched him in his back or something. <laughs> and he got his booking. And we're like, oh, that's really, really clever, that is, because he's got himself a booking. When really he should have got sent off because he was just basically <laughs> battering this bloke. Wait, uh, was it in a bad way he needed the booking as in like he wanted a holiday or did he like need to I get his suspension it, out of the way for a crap it was a game? Su- suspension for a crap game so it was for a cup game or something i think oh, yeah. so he was just um i think he stole the ball from the net then he ran away with the ball then the player got the ball back and you sort of think well that's the end of it nah 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 he started running after the player who had just, just taken his shirt off celebrated yeah, that's the point, yeah. Yeah. pushed a ref or or something, I don't know. He also oh. sets himself a personal target at the start of the season for yellow cards, much in the same way as strikers do with goals. <laughs> um, I do love it. Allegedly. Um, right, OK, anything else on Grimsby, or should we toss it over to Dominic to talk about Newport County next week? There was just one thing more that I want to say, since we've only mentioned Nathan Clark um, out of the whole Grimsby side and Russell Slade. Is their player, Dembele, who... Um, I was earmarked by Side Sammy as like a potential threat and I'd kind of forgotten about where he was from. He's actually from the Nike Academy, not from a pub team, as he's pointed out. Um, and he was kind of like what Jody Jones... He was kind of like a half and half of Jody Jones and that Ot Stumer guy from Walsall. Uh, oh, Ehun Ostumer, yeah, the uh, Turkish lad. And he was brilliant and he kind of ambled through our defence three times and we got a bit lucky but I know it's early days but is, is this what this league's going to be like it's just going to be like so many average players and then when you come up against a good player it was a bit like that in league one but it's going to be so blindingly obvious that they're better than their surroundings and you're just going to have to make sure that they don't do anything good because if they don't then you've got to maybe wait for a pass back from Nathan Clark to score your goal that's basically what happened against Notts County was it? it was there was twenty one footballers, and then there was Jody Jones, and I got criticism for this. But if Jody Jones had been on the Notts County team, they probably would have won because he was clearly standing out. 
as and it's not even the fact that you know both teams had lots of functional footballers, but there appears to be only one or two players who really have that. And I hate to say it, but the X factor, that bit where you like they get the ball and you're actually interested, and it is quite stark because they do just like, oh, he's got the ball. He looks really like he wants to do something exciting. I'm going to watch him now. And as you say, it's, even when I think we'll notice a lot of League One clubs, you sort of couldn't name one of their players. I think if we see one of those standout players playing against us, I think we'll probably note it for every team. There'll be one player on every team. And we're like, he was quite good because the rest of them were pretty shit. I think that's why we, the Stevenson thing's a bit more galling because he could potentially be one of those players. Like if you played against Stevenson, you'd notice him just because he is so confident on the ball. He picks a pass. He can score from 40 yards. Um, and it wasn't like, it sounds like Notts County, we won 3-0 and it was like quite a tight game still. Grimsby, like, they were rubbish, but we scored from a technicality and a corner. Like, we didn't tear them to shreds. Like, we could quite easily be on two points at the moment, not six. And I know that's super, like, fatalistic and bleak to say that but we're we're not tearing the division to pieces we've won two games relatively fortunately we've kept two clean sheets i suppose but Laurie, we... Laurie, we don't have that sort of negativity on the pod i was just about <laughs> to say far be it from us to be fatalistic and negative <laughs> i see what, what you, i see what you're saying I, I, do th- I do think it's um a Hall- it's a Robins thing, isn't it? I don't think Robins. That's how Robins teams win games, aren't? Isn't it? Me, 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 I think Neil, you're probably right. We probably were loads better than them, but because I didn't think we were playing well, I assumed they were playing at the same level of us as us. If that makes sense, just because it was nil nil for a long time, but we we were definitely we were better than them, but I wasn't it blown great away. With, yeah. Performance, yeah. I mean, um, Rob Jones on Twitter sent me a tweet and just said, we're really resilient. And I, that's, I think, what we sort of thought at the start of the season. Mark Robbins has got 10 resilient players and Jody Jones. And I think we're all hoping that as the season progresses, you can, I don't mind having Kelly and Doyle ahead of Stevenson, as long as I start to see new tone and duck introduced, because I want to see more. I, my worry is if Jones is our only outlet, someone will just reduce him in the first five minutes. And then you're looking at Vincenzi to provide something, which we know he's not going to do and Kelly and Doyle. So I think we just need to increase our options. But at the moment I can't, I don't think he's going to change the starting 11 for next out for Newport, is he? Wasn't it only last week that you were saying that you weren't judging Vincenti? <laughs> He's Vincenti now. <laughs> and that you've just straight away, you've now gone in and said that you know he won't provide anything. No, no, no so what I mean is, he doesn't sit, I mean, he's not looking like a creative player at the moment. I could be wrong. True. But he, he's... You're not wrong. At the moment, <laughs> if you, he, he's... Because the way I look at football is sometimes you just need... If you have three or four players with pace, they're going to create create the space for Vincenzi to, to do his best in. At the moment, we've got one player with pace, so we're quite a one-pace team, and Vincenzi doesn't seem to be providing much with his feet in tight situations, so he's not create, he's not having a lot of space. Also, I don't think um, Stokes is fully fit, so I don't know how Laurie thought Stokes played, but that combination... Because from, I could be wrong, but on the, the two games previously, Jones has played more on the right than on the left, where he's, he's formed quite a good partnership with Grimmer. That's definitely, of our two wings, the creative wing, because there's two of them trying to get forward. On the left-hand side, it's very much a more stoic wing. So he's not even like he can play... He's not even getting sort of stoked bombing past him, so there's a lot of creativity there either. Or, as we've discussed in the past, Joey, a lot of times is sometimes... If you just got a fullback breaking past you, it creates space for you yeah. as well. Yeah. That dynamic I haven't seen on that side yet. So <clears throat> I would be worried if, if the first five minutes against Newton, uh, Newport, if Jones went off and we brought on sort of someone like Ben Stevenson, I'd be worried that we wouldn't have any uh, enough pace or creativity in the team. Fair dues. Shall we move on to Dominic's Newport preview? 
Yep. Yes, we absolutely shall. Uh, Dominic, who is at Side Sammy and the author of SidewaySammy.wordpress.com, uh, joined us again this week to talk about Newport and what they're going to offer. And here that is now. Hello, Dominic. Thanks again for joining us. Hi, right, it's good to be on the show. Uh, Newport County on Saturday drawn their first two games, one all and three one. How do you think they'll fare this season? Um, so Newport, um, I sort of one of those clubs in League Two who just don't really seem that well set up to be in the football league. Sort of clubs like Accrington, Yeovil, and Morecambe. I would say sort of Newport are sort of the club that seem like least likeliest to be a football league club. They've got one of the smallest budgets, don't get great attendances there, and last season. And for the past few seasons, we've been playing on an absolute potato field of a pitch, which gets just tons of cancellations and postponements every season. Uh, that's been sorted out over the summer. Um, and generally, they just churn through players and managers, and it just just seems an absolutely shambolic setup. However, uh, Michael Flynn, the manager at the moment, he came in uh, towards the end of last season, sort of the same time as Mark Robbins came in uh, to us, and sort of in a similar situation where this kind of looked already down but he strung together a really miraculous run of wins and he managed to survive on the final day and then going over the summer uh, I think uh, Flynn has quite impressed me sort of just tried to avoid the mistakes of recent years he tried to keep quite a settled squad while shifting on some of that dead wood and uh, bringing in some a, a few players who sort of improved the squad and based on their first few games they've sort of found goals quite easy to come by and um they have shown quite a uh, strong team spirit to sort of come from behind on a few occasions. So I think they'll survive fairly comfortably this season, possibly even outsiders for the playoffs if things go really well. Is Michael Flynn... Ah. Oh, sorry, go on. No. Oh, is Michael Flynn their player manager, am I right in thinking, or is he retired? Was he playing for them at some point recently? I think he's retired over the summer. I mean, he's about 36, and... I think he was brought in last season as a player coach who played about four games. So it's very much, if he if he's still registered as a player, he's not going to play unless it's an absolute emergency. Right, I see. Of the players that they have got registered, who should we uh, look out for? I think Frank Newble is the obvious name that will attract the attention of Cov fans. Yeah, uh, Frank Newble of, uh, obviously, Coventry City, Name Mongol, Zong Yu, and about a thousand other clubs. Um, he's actually started the season quite well. Um, I mean, obviously, for a club like Newport, that's quite a big signing for them. I mean, it was quite a big signing for us when he joined us, like, two or three years ago. Uh, he scored two goals in uh, his in the two league games thus far. Uh, his strike partner is Sean Mikulski, who's on loan from Bristol City, and he's hit the ground running, sort of more of a pacier option alongside Newblay. He seems to be quite a good finisher. Uh, Mikulski scored three in... Uh, their three games, including two in a League Cup match. We've also got Lamar Reynolds to bring off from the bench, who um, scored an absolute buttload of goals in the eighth tier for Brentwood Town. So it's potentially uh, sort of one of those could be the next Jamie Vardy sort of style players just brought from non-league from nowhere, really. Uh, and then in midfield, we've got Matt Dolan, who's one of those, those sort of technically gifted sort of good passing midfielders you occasionally get in the two who just aren't quite mobile enough to make the step up another level. Um, he's going to be followed by Josh Labadee, who's also sort of uh, a player who's ha- had the chance to play at a high level a few times, but he seems to have some sort of discipline with issues. And um, I think over the past two or three seasons, he had about, he's had a couple of bans for biting. So um, for, for biting? Yeah, I think he's oh, okay. been banned twice for biting. Wow, OK. Uh, yeah, so they're, they're their main threats, I'd say. Uh, and how about their setup? Or what, what sort of formation are we expecting to come up against? And what about the general style of play? Um, so uh, the general setup in sort of a 5 3 2 formation, and like, they do like to have sort of numbers at the back, sort of flood in the middle of the pitch. They're quite used to over the past few months under Flynn just fighting and scrapping for every point. I mean, I, I heard reports from sort of crew fans from their last match that. Newport were quite cynical, sort of making quite niggly fouls, um, not scared to sort of uh, 
died and time went stuff like that. So it could be quite a frustrating game. Sort of one I'd imagine uh, Michael Doyle will, will relish that sort of fight. Um, they have scored a lot of goals this season from set pieces as well. They seem to be very good at, at exploiting that. So I think we've got to be prepared for a team that's going to come to the Rico and try and, have, try and sort of eke one out and come in for a real battle. I mean, it's going to be a really big game for a club like Newport. Are you looking for a week where you can talk about a team that has a sort of neat passing game or attacking intent rather than it just being a team of thugs, which has been most of the week so far? Yeah, I mean, there are there are a few teams to look forward to when they're passing, but given that we've sort of beaten the thugs, then I suppose we've got to keep keep the thugs coming, really. Yeah, clearly. Well, um, what about predictions for Saturday, then? So I, I recognise that not only have I been quite pessimistic about our games this season, but I, I've also been wrong. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking this could be a 2-2 draw, but I'm where I'm sort of naturally a pessimistic person, apparently. So, honestly, it's <laughs> definitely going to be a 2-1 win and everyone should just put their mortgages on it. <laughs> yeah, I noticed a number of people chipping off on on Twitter about um, the negativity of your predictions and also the kind of suggestion that should you should pr- predict a win, it would act as some sort of curse. The level of superstition when it comes to football is never something that um, ceases to amaze. Yeah, I mean, we're all guilty of it, so let's not, uh, not criticise. <laughs> no, clearly. OK, um, anything else on Newport? No, that's, that's all you need to know on Newport. Fabulous. All right, speak to you again next week. OK, no, look Thanks. forward to it. Bye-bye. Bye. OK, thanks for that, Dominic. Um, we are going to move on to some, some, something that we talked about last week after we finished recording, which was Peter Vincenti again and his riposte to somebody who had criticised him in a blog or on Twitter or something to say, well, I got the assist and, and that was that. And, Paul, you had the specific thought about that situation, didn't you? Well, it wasn't just him. It was also someone had been criticising... Um, Maxime going, well, he didn't play particularly well. And Saul came up and went, but he, he got an assist on his debut. And you were like, okay, we have to then, we have to look at this, the word assist, because obviously it's, it's going to be a big thing this season. And there are different types of assist. Now, on Neil's blog, he had the gif of, of James Madison scoring against Port Vale. And basically, John Fleck took a free kick, rolled it a yard, James Madison then skinned his man and killed the ball into the bottom corner. John Fleck got an assist for that. That's fine. You know, he was the last person prior to Madison who touched the ball. But it's a bit, you know. And then Kyle Reid obviously put in that absolutely pinging cross (laughs) against Wigan for George Thomas to score. In my opinion, that's an assist. An assist has to be either a, a cross or a pass which really sets a player away. If it's just the last touch before the player who scores, yeah, technically we'll call it an assist with a small a, but really it's the player who scored the goals done the most of the work there. And it's like, you take it back like the um, Darren Hookery goal against Man United. No one knows who assisted that goal. Do you want to know why? Because no one cares. Because Darren Hookery got the ball and skinned about 10 players and put it in the bottom corner. Well, it, I wanted to... People, do, people do know, but, um, but yeah, you still don't care. <laughs> I wanted it's to chuck like in that, some... That's... Sorry, go on, Paul, Karen. But that, that's just... And there are other, you know... So I think, I think we have to sort of take an exception that, yes, there are assists with a small A, but we're only going to really comment and get excited about the assist with a big A, which is a breath is, is a major contribution to the goal and not just the last teammate to kick it. Well, on that particular point, I would like to go back to that Man United goal that Huckabee scored and suggest that, conversely, we're also not crediting people with assists where they should be. And I would say that for that goal, Noel Whelan, forcibly American football star, blocking two players off, should get the assist there. <laughs> so good. Yeah, I mean, because as soon as you start, it was the instant thing in my head was, you remember Huckabee running with the ball and you remember Noel Whelan blocking two players off. But it's, I was assist, talking to someone and I was like, oh, who gave the assist for um, Ryan Giggs' goal against Arsenal in that, you know, the really famous one? And everyone was like Vieira, scratching around. It? Yeah, it's Patrick Vieira. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's yeah. just, it does, you know, I think we, I know everyone wants to, 
you know, doesn't want to slag off the new guys. That's fine. But I think we have to sort of say, yeah, it was an, it was an assist. It will go down in the records as an assist. But let's not get excited and go, it was an assist and use it to prove a point. He just passed to a teammate. Jody Jones did all the hard work for both the goals. And I said this after last week's pod, the only goal I credit with actual an assist with an A, capital A, was the Ducks where he sort of did two men and then rolled the ball through so Jones was through one-on-one. That was an assist in my book. The other two were just passes to a teammate. Let's take Would this. anyone oh, argue God. with you on that, though? Because like, surely that's inarguable. Like. Well, it, it's about being defined, isn't it? It's, I think you can't define... Because each one, there's arguments on each single pass almost. You can Sometimes you'll get to a point where, hey, did he mean that pass or did he not mean that pass? And it's just... They're going to use it because we live in that sort of Optus society now, don't we, where everything needs to be quantified and every single... These players especially. So you look at last year and um, Jacob Murphy got, what, 12 assists? That looks good for him, doesn't it? He's, he got 12 assists and he's, he's going to use that stat. You could probably delve into the detail of it. And there's some of those where you think probably don't warrant being called an assist, but it's they're just two sides to it, aren't there? There's the, there's the sheer sort of numerical trying to put a number on absolutely everything that happens on the football pitch. And that's what the Opta guys are doing. And that's what fantasy football's doing. It's just it's quite an Americanised way of doing it because everything's an assist in basketball. I, I do agree. I'm just I'm, I'm trying to rationalise why they throw these in there because they're just so prevalent, aren't they? Now everybody's talking about sort of the numbers behind the you know, the pass percentages and everything. It's just there. Yeah, and it's like you say, it comes from fantasy football and stuff. And as you quite rightly say, for someone like Jacob Murphy, it improves your brand, doesn't it? If you mm. are on a, if you want to engineer a move to Newcastle, it's a great selling point for your agent to pick up with potential suitors. Um, I wanted to go through a sort of uh, admittedly very tongue-in-cheek list so far of suggested changes and see whether you'd like to to add any more. I would hazard a guess. I would like to see own assists. So when you talk about Vieira's there, <laughs> yeah. let's, let's start crediting players, yes. of op- opposition players, for their version. I mean, Nathan Clark gets the assist, presumably, for Mark McNulty. Um, oh, yeah, perfect three ball. Left I, don't one see, on one with the I don't see anywhere. Yeah, I mean, Danny Seaborn, the king of the own assist for us over the last few years. Um, Does this mean we're going to start scratching off goals when they don't complete, like when those keepers like score goals <laughs> by bouncing it in the puddle? Does that, do they not get it anymore? Does that go to the pitch? or? I don't know, possibly. Yeah. I mean, can part- you assist yourself? What about if you hit the post? Is that an assist? <laughs> or if you just kick the ball through and then you, you, you pick up the well, the through ball to yourself? Is that a thing? Yeah, well, Paul, That's you... That's a Scott Minto. I was going to say, yeah. Exactly, Can, yeah. Do you yeah, want to explain the Scott Minto again for those who might not remember it? The Scott, the Scott Minto, he played the ball down the wing, realised no one else was going to go for it, so ran after it himself and got there. That's an it was, assist. Yeah, I mean, that is... Because it's also sort of... With all this Opta stuff, obviously... Um, can you remember it was the season that Andrew Johnson was at Palace and he won about 15 penalties? Hmm. Yeah. You wonder that there's no bigger things like, we'll sign this guy because he wins about 10 penalties a season. You know, sort of really break it down. But are the I'm reason... Really yeah, I mean, the day I, I lost complete faith in all this bollocks was when we had um, my particular favourite, Stephen Hughes, at the club. And in one game, like, someone was raving about his pass completion rate. And about five times he was on the left-hand side of the pitch. Someone like Marcus Hall had rolled in the ball because Marcus Hall had had two people on him and Stephen Hughes had passed him the ball back. And you were like, that's 100% pass yeah. completion, but you passed it to a player with two men around him and on the touchline. So Marcus Hall gave the ball away and you're like, you, you basically... Yeah. Are, yeah. So Marcus Hall gets zero pass completion rate, but Stephen Hughes, you played him into complete trouble. What's over going, <laughs> well, that's another completed pass for the old Hughesmeister. You're like, you bastard. <laughs> it's like um, when Gary Neville scored that own goal for England. Nobody remembers that. They remember the fact they went under Paul Robinson's leg. Yeah. That's Paul Robinson's fault. And Gary Neville's the one who gets the own goal. Yeah, well, didn't he? But the thing with that, it's like, oh, it's just completely off topic. But you're passing it back to a keeper. Why the fuck are you hitting it right in the middle of the goal? Surely you make sure if, if he does fuck up, it goes out for a goal kick. That's in the a corner. first rule of defending, isn't it? Oh, not pass it to where the keeper is. Hasn't Neville openly... <laughs> Don't aim at the goal. <laughs> Don't aim at the goal. Don't pass it back to the keeper. If you've got two options of hacking it anywhere or passing it back to the keeper in front of his own goal and that goalkeeper's Paul Robinson, hack it anywhere. Even use your wrong foot. Just don't give it back. You're, as my mate Jimbo would say all the time, you're the professional footballer. You're the person paid to kick the fucking football. 
stop giving it back to the keeper. Because when the keeper fucks up, everyone goes, ah, oh, it's the keeper. It's like the amount of times the defender doesn't need to play the ball back to a keeper. And then the keeper shanks the, 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 his kick. And everyone goes, ah, oh, the keeper can't kick. And it's like, well, why is your sort of, you know, right back who's on 90 grand a week got N number of England caps and won N number of league titles? Why is he passing the ball back to the keeper anyway? Just That's fucking risk. kick it yourself. That is one thing that um, we seem to have just completely cut out of our game now. It's like faffing around with it from goal kicks. Like Jordan Willis was doing a particularly good brand of just lumping it whenever there was anyone remotely near him. Just like no no chances taken. Just get rid, which I quite like. Yeah, very much so. Have we um, put the assists world to right? I feel like we have. Probably, probably not, but... <laughs> <laughs> we might not have been entirely serious about some of it, as you could probably guess. Um, do we have any plugs? Do we have any other business? Or should we wrap this bad boy up? I think That's... we're good. Looking forward to Newport. Yeah, well, yeah, quite. Um, Laurie, you've got your Grimsby report that's available for people to read if they want to get more from you. Where can they find that? Uh, at the lonely season dot club, uh, and Neil, give us a refresh on the latest goings on your end. Just a bunch of stuff. I did the Robbie Keane article, like I said, with that. I quite enjoyed that one. So have a look. That's Sky very good. Dot co dot uk. Any um, sneak peek into who might be featured next? Well, it's a toss up between um, Lauren Delorge and um, <laughs> Peter and Love. So we'll have to see. It's a curious position you must find yourself in, that even with sort of 25 years of active support, you're pretty much running out of players that could be considered <laughs> for <laughs> um, Paul, want to give us an update on anything you've been doing at work over the last few weeks? No. No, didn't think so. <laughs> um, in that case, then, let's wrap it up. Laurie, big thanks for coming in and talking to us about Grimsby. No worries, my pleasure. Paul and Neil, thank you as usual. Cheers, buddy. Cheers, mate. And an extra thank you to you, Snap. Bye!